ಭಗವತೆ ಶ್ರೀರಮಣಾಯ ಸೊ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ವಿ ವೇರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸಿಂಗ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ನಂಬರ್ ತರ್ಟಿ ಫೋರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೇರ್ ದ ಡಿಸ್ಕಶನ್ ವಾಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಜ್ಞಾನಿ and it was said tasya sthitim bhavachitum kh kshamah who is capable of visualizing the state of jeevan mukti the state of mind of a jeevan mukta mm-hmm. and as we had seen i had quoted uh, the, the dakshnamurti stotram vishpam darpana drashyamana nagari tulyam nijantargatam ಪಶ್ಯನ್ನಾತ್ಮನಿ ಮಾಯ ಬಹಿರಿವೋದ್ಭೂತ ಯತಾನಿತ್ರಯ ಯತ್ ಸಾಕ್ಷಾತ್ ಹುರುತೆ ಪ್ರಬೋಧ ಸಮಯ ಸ್ವಾತ್ಮನ ಮೇವಾದ್ವಯ ಪ್ರಬೋಧ ಸಮಯ ದೈಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಾನ್ ಆಫ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ದ ಜ್ಞಾನಿ ಡಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಸಿ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಅದರ್ ದನ್ ದ ಆತ್ಮ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಈಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಎಸ್ ಆತ್ಮ superimposed with names and forms so that state of mind of the gnani is unfathomable who is capable of visualizing that state of jeevan mukti <clears throat> of course nobody can imagine the state of mind of such a jeevan mukta so we continue today with verse number 34 I think last time we had the discussion was verse number 33 i misspoke and said it was 34 today we start with verse number 34 let us read ah sputam tatvam asiti vedah ah sputam tatvam asiti vedah ತಾಪ್ಯ ಸಂಪ್ರಾಪ್ಯ ಪರಂ ಪರಾತ್ಮನಿಷ್ಠಾಪ್ಯ ಸಂಪ್ರಾಪ್ಯ ಪರಾತ್ಮನಿಷ್ಠ ಭೂಯೋ ವಿಚಾರೋ ಮತಿ ದುರ್ಬಲ ಭೂಯೋ ವಿಚಾರೋ ಮತಿ ದುರ್ಬಲ ತತ್ಸರ್ವತ್ಮತೆಯ ಹಿ ಭಾತಿ ಆಹಸ್ಫುಟಿ ವೇದ ತಾಪ್ಯ ಸಂಪ್ರಾಪ್ಯ ಪರಾತ್ಮನಿಷ್ಠ ಭೂಯೋ ವಿಚಾರೋ ಮತಿ ದುರ್ಬಲ ತತ್ಸರ್ವತ್ಮತೆಯ ಹಿ ಭಾತಿ so in this verse through this verse bhagwan <coughs> tells us how we should use this vedanta vichara <coughs> we are talking about atma vichara vedanta vichara etc etc <coughs> but how exactly we should use it in bhagwan gives ramana maharshi gives here a statutory warning if you do not use this vichara properly it will not give you the intended result it will be a problem <clears throat> so we have to clearly understand the question is what is the purpose of vedanta vichara only if i know that then i will use it properly otherwise i will abuse it misuse it we will know we will not know how to handle it properly vedanta vichara is a means for securing our independence from everything vedanta vichara through that we try to accomplish independence from everything emotional dependence on anything we need to get rid of be it secular or sacred i do not depend on anything even dependence on god is still a dependence we have touched upon this topic before 
any dependence irrespective of the object of dependence is samsara vedanta goes to such an extent that it says vedanta itself should not be a source of dependence that is how ruthless it is vedanta should give me total independence from everything and that includes vedanta itself this goal should not be forgotten am i doing vedanta vichara for what purpose and as i am doing that i should use it for educating myself i should use it for enlightening myself it is a medium of education to be free from all dependence if i forget this goal vedanta itself may be used as a source of enjoyment instead of being a means of education it may be used as a means of entertainment or enjoyment certainly enjoy while getting educated but instead if you do not get educated and you just use it as an enjoyment as an entertainment like any other enjoyment or entertainment then that vedanta becomes a waste so primary purpose is education enlightenment not entertainment the purpose of vedanta is to reveal to me that i myself is a source of joy if i am not careful as i pursue this i will use vedanta as a source of joy i begin to depend on vedanta for my happiness for peace attachment to every other thing is replaced by my attachment to vedanta whenever there is a threat to the study and the inquiry of vedanta say you are hearing goes down memory starts fading then i am irritated now vedanta being a source of independence has become a crutch your relationship vedanta will not be any different than attachment to any other object these are all the indications that i am not using vedanta properly so bhagwan gives ramana maharshi gives this unique advice in this verse <clears throat> so he says vedah tat tvam asi iti sputham ah vedanta clearly tells you vedan vedah ah vedanta clearly tells you that you are brahman tat vam tvam asi it is putam very clearly it tells you you are that brahman and that is the source of peace and happiness that means vedanta is not the source of peace and happiness do you get that point says you are brahman and that brahman is the source of joy and peace therefore you must learn to derive joy and peace from you yourself and not even from vedanta vedanta iti sputam clearly ah says says so guru will also say that do not depend on me also be independent if you get attached to your guru that is a problem a guru makes his student free if the guru were to become dependent on the student then the guru will also be a samsari <laughs> he does not let the student go free he holds on to them shotriya brahmanishta guru will not do that we see that we see that in the worldly life 
so many parents just do not let go of their children that brings so many problems in the family same thing guru also should let the student go shishya go mm -hmm. <clears throat> we were just talking before the class balwan ji was explaining how they don't keep pictures of the guru or anything mm -hmm. that is the, that's the point mm -hmm. you cannot have dependence on the guru the guru should not have dependence on the shishya mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is the clear teaching that vedanta itself is not a source of peace and joy in spite of this tatapi there are some people paratma nishtam asamprapya there are some people asamprapya who do not attain this nishta this abidance in their own brahman nature they do not abide in their atma swarupa that is what needs to happen they do not draw their peace and joy from themselves instead they try to derive that happiness from vedanta from the relationship with the guru so on and so forth previously they were going to movies watching tv sports entertainment on tv traveling hanging out with friends and the like and we are very happy doing all those things now the difference is they try to get the same from the vedanta class <laughs> they derive peace and joy from vedanta vichar that is not the ultimate purpose of vedanta vichar please understand this properly i am not saying that you should not enjoy these classes you should not enjoy this vedanta vichara i am not saying that okay but let that not be the crutch mm -hmm. through that vichara through those classes through that education you need to reach the final goal don't let vedanta vichara become an avocation just like an addict does not give up or her addiction do not become an addict to this addict to vedanta vichara use that for what it is mm -hmm. if you use that as a dependence then you will become miserable so many things can happen therefore bhagwan ramana maharshi says here puya hai vichar hai the one who goes on doing continuous inquiry losing sight of the the original purpose why did you embark upon this path what is your goal forget lose sight of that mati durbalatvam that is immaturity of mind if you remember the purpose and continue the inquiry that is gnana yoga that is gnana marga sadhana you are a sadhak genuine seeker no problem with that that's good but if you forget the purpose and mechanically continue the inquiry that is dangerous make sure you evaluate your purpose why you are on this journey sooner or later you should be independent of even the inquiry i will be the most happiest person if one of you were to come and tell me anand ji i got what i needed starting next week i am not going to attend the classes <laughs> i got it what you are trying to convey to me i got it you are no more a sadhak you are a siddha purusha you have accomplished what you set out to so don't lose sight of that fact 
So Bhagwan wants here, do not make Vedanta into another addiction. Vedanta is meant for liberation, not for binding you. Guru is meant for liberating you, not for binding you. Then, that, that Paramatma, which is the source of peace and joy, Sarvada Bhati, is always available, always accessible. It is closer than Vedanta. You don't even have to reach out to Vedanta to tap peace and joy. That Paramatma is ever available, Swatmataya, as your own inner nature. The original source of joy and peace is closer to you than anything else, including Vedanta. You don't have to go anywhere. It is you yourself. Then what is the need for Vedanta? Vedanta is for telling you that you are the source. That's all. So Swatmataya, as your inner nature, your, act, your happiness is accessible, is always available to you. Do not go for other sources. Vedanta clearly says that. Ahas putam, that tatvam asi, you are that. You are that bliss, that bliss is your nature. Itatapi asam prapya paratma nishtam, you still cannot gain that abundance in the self, then it is because of your weakness, a weak mind. Mati durbalatvam. Or Lack of effort. What you need to do is bhuyo vichara. Inquire again and again. Then tat sarvada swatmatayahi bhati. That paramatma will shine as your own self. So sometimes when you read these verses, we get confused. I say downplaying the role of Vedanta. So we have to understand these things properly. Especially Bhagwan Ramana Maharshi is ruthless. He will call a spade a spade. Even this Vedanta, do not use it as a crutch. Got to go beyond that. Continuing verse number. 35. Verse number 35. Now, what is the name of the name Na vedya hamma muta vedma yahamma ite pravado manujasya hasya hai ite pravado manujasya hasya hai drag drishya vedat timayam dvidatma drag drishya vedat timayam dvidatma Swatmai katayam hidhiyam na bedah. Swatmai katayam hidhiyam na bedah. Look at that. Na vedya hamma muta vedna yamma. Yete pravado manujas ya hasya hai. Drag drishya bedat timayam dvidatma. So in this verse, Bhagavan is going to talk about the unique feature of Atma Jnana. Self-knowledge is very unique. Even though it takes place in the intellect only. Hmm. Yet, 
it is distinct from all conventional forms of knowledge. All knowledge has to take place and its locus is mind or intellect only. So that is why we talk about so many sadhanas for purifying that mind. And the qualifications are always prescribed as purity of mind, concentration of mind, all that. Body is not the locus of knowledge. Atma is also not the locus of knowledge. Intellect alone is where it has to happen. It is beyond intellect, but the knowledge happens there. That is why it gets complicated and confusing. It gets confusing. <clears throat> Any knowledge anything that you get to know hmm, requires a means or instrument of knowledge. Hmm. It can be direct perception, can be an inference, and so on and so forth. In that way, self-knowledge also requires an appropriate means of knowledge. The requirement of a valid pramana means of knowledge that is there even for self-knowledge, atma jnanam also. But in what respect is it unique? In it, in this knowledge, what happens is that subject and the object both of them are one and the same. The requirement should satisfy that. This is what is unique. The subject and the object, one and the same. The subject is I. I am the knower, the pramata. And then the Pramaya, what is to be known, that is also I. The object of knowledge, I know myself. <laughs> I the self is the subject, I the self is the object. This is what is unique about self-knowledge. And that itself becomes a problem. Logically speaking, a subject and object cannot be identical in a transaction, including the process of knowledge. The subject can never be an object. Eyes can see everything, but the eye cannot see itself. The seer cannot be the seen. And how do you talk about self-knowledge? So we have to clearly understand the process of self-knowledge. That is what is important. Self-knowledge, Atma Jnana, is not an event in which the unknown self is going to be known. In all other worldly knowledge, that is the case. But when it comes to Atma, there is no question of knowing an unknown Atma. If you talk about knowing an unknown Atma, it will amount to objectification of Atma. Atma will then become an object. So when you talk about the knowledge happening as an event in time, then it means you have made it an object. Before objectification, it was not known. After objectification, it becomes known. This is a normal process. Such an explanation is not possible in the case of Atma, because Atma is never to be objectified. Atma happens to be of the nature of consciousness. 
And that can never be objectified. If you were to talk about objectifying consciousness, the question will become, who will do that? Who will objectify consciousness? What are all the possibilities? Matter. Matter cannot objectify. Why? Because matter is matter. It is inert. It is jada. How can the insentient inert jada vastu objectify consciousness? Matter cannot objectify consciousness. Because it is inert, it cannot illumine anything. Okay. So, you need a conscious entity and can a second conscious entity objectify consciousness? That is also not possible. Why? Okay, be a conscious entity, objectifies A. Okay, then you will ask the question, what will objectify conscious B? You go for another entity, C, objectifying B. Then the question becomes, What consciousness can objectify C? You introduce a D. So it will go on at infinitum. That is not possible. There cannot be a second conscious entity that would objectify consciousness. Not possible. You cannot even speak of one part of consciousness objectifying another part. Hmm? Consciousness is partless. You talk about body, okay? This is one body, but it has parts. Hands are there. Hmm? I can talk about my finger touching my nose because these are two different parts of the body. We cannot talk of consciousness, one part of consciousness objectifying another part of consciousness. Because it is partless, no parts. So consciousness is never available for objectification. Knowing consciousness or objectifying consciousness is ruled out, not possible. This is also, you know, I've been speaking in terms of consciousness. Also true if you change the word of knowing to experiencing. Matter cannot experience consciousness. Again, for the same reason, inert. Only a conscious entity can go through this experience. A sentient entity can experience. There cannot be a consciousness which will experience the first consciousness. That's also not possible. One part of consciousness cannot experience another part. Knowing or experiencing consciousness, they are all misconceptions. No such things are possible. Not possible. The only consolation is you need not know or objectify consciousness at all. Knowing is required only when there is ignorance regarding that thing. I am here in this house, okay? And on the street, 
there may be a car that is parked. I do not know whether it is there or not. Because there is something, there is ignorance of what is there, what is not there. That can go only when I go see. Then that object, whatever is outside, becomes an object of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Nobody is ignorant of consciousness because everybody knows that I am a conscious being. When it comes to consciousness, that is what is unique about it. Do you know you are there? Are you conscious of yourself? Everybody has to say yes. Unlike an inert thing, everybody knows I am conscious. There is no need of requiring knowing as a process, not necessary. Knowing consciousness is not possible and not required also. So, Atma Jnanam, do not try to understand this, do not take it as any other conventional process of knowing. Just like you know other objects, don't think of Atma Jnanam in the same light. So this is something we need to keep in mind. Therefore, Bhagavan says, whoever says, I know Atma, someone were to come up to you and say, I know Atma. Or someone comes up and says, I do not know what this Atma is. Okay. Bhagwan says, both are jokers. <laughs> both statements are humorous, he says, born out of ignorance. That's what he says in this verse. He says, Manujasya pravadaha hasya hasyam. Hilarious, he says. <laughs> Sprattling, people are just babbling. I know Atma, I don't know Atma. When people say all that. Aham, Mam, Na, Vedmi. I do not know me. I do not know the self. Uta or Aham, Mam, Vedmi. I know me. <laughs> I know the self. So Ramana Maharshi says both statements are laughable. Both situations do not exist. To say I know me is the objectification of myself. And to say I do not know me is to deny oneself. If knowledge of oneself is possible, ignorance of oneself is also not possible. Grammatically also, it's not correct. Because you cannot have a transitive verb in a sentence in which the subject and object are the same. The reason is most of us have forgotten what is subject, object, what is transitive, what is intransitive. <laughs> so we will not go too much into that. Mm -hmm. So he, he asked the question, I am Atma Dvidakim. Does Atma exist in twofold ways? Does the cons consciousness exist in a divided manner? Mm -hmm. As subject and object. Drik drishya vedat. Can it exist as the seer and the seen? Is that possible? As a seer and what is seen. 
does the consciousness ever, ever exist in the form of subject and the object? If it is the subject, it can never be the object. And if it is an object, it can never be the subject. then how can you in one and the same sentence say, I know myself? So that type of Atma Jnana is a logical contradiction. Can never happen as an event in time. So he concludes, he indeed. Swatmaika tayam tayam. Since Atma is only one, na beda, beda hai, there is no subject-object dichotomy. Such a division is not possible. Dhyam, with regard to self-knowledge, such divisions are not possible. No subject-object division is possible. Therefore, I know me, I do not, do not know me. Both st statements are invalid. They are not valid at all. In Keno Upanishad, you may recall, the guru tells the student, Yadi manya se suve deti, dabra me Vapi nunam tvam vete brahmano rupam yadasya tvam yadasya cha deveshu atanu mimamsya mevate. If you think you know Brahman very well, the Guru tells a student, you know very little. Whatever you know as Brahman, that is also very doubtful. And the Guru speaks to your Shishya like that. He can tell you. <laughs> Poor student. But that student was very qualified student. When he heard that, he went back and contemplated on that. Mm -hmm. And he came back and told the Guru, Naham manyesu vedeti, Nona vedeti vedacha, Yonas tat veda tat veda, Nona vedeti vedacha. <laughs> he said, he also give, gave a very fitting uh, reply. I don't think I know that Brahman. But that does not mean I do not know. I know it very well. <laughs> student is also great. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I ask you about someone other than you, do you know Krishna Kumar? I don't know. Do you know Ram Kumar? Yes, yes, yes. I know Ram Kumar. So you can make statements like that. I do not know Krishna Kumar. I know Ram Kumar. All that is possible. You can make statements like that. But if I ask you about yourself, do you know yourself? You cannot say, I know myself. I do not know myself. What will you say? It is me. <laughs> it is I. Even it is me is grammatically wrong. I. No question of I know or I do not know. Such differences in that knowledge, not possible about oneself. 
how can there be a seer and the scene with respect to oneself? It so happens, you know, in the Wednesday class, in Upadesha Sara, the same idea came. Same idea. We studied that. Upadesha mm -hmm. Sara, you may recall, mm -hmm. Atma Nirdvayat, Atma Nishta. Nishtata, Atma Samsiti, Swatma Darshanam. So this kind of Darshanam is only Atma Nishta. Atma Samsiti. Abiding in that. That self. That is Atma Darshanam. Swatma Darshanam. Being the self. Is seeing the self. Very important. It cannot be known as something else. You got to be that. Then the basic question is, what is this self-knowledge? So first, we should clearly know there is no question of knowing Atma because the conscious being is an ever-known fact. That I am conscious is ever known. Nobody has a doubt about that with regard to this fact. No need to tell anybody that you are a conscious entity. To be able to listen to such saying, someone has to be conscious. So that is not what is being taught. So what is the purpose of self knowledge? With regard to the known fact that is very evident, mm -hmm. there are so many notions. I am a conscious being is an evident fact, but about me, I have so many other concepts, so many notions. They are all objects of my knowledge. Atma is not an object of knowledge. It is an ever evident known fact for all human beings. But concepts about Atma, about the self, are objects of our knowledge. The basic concept is that I am mortal. <laughs> okay. So I have a notion that I am mortal. Mortality is a concept in mind about me. I am located in a particular place. I am here in Cleveland. You are all there in Salisbury. <laughs> that is another concept about me. I am so many years old. That is another concept about me, another notion. So, in the scriptures, when they talk about all this, we are not dealing with Atma directly, but we deal with all these conclusions about myself. Mm -hmm. All these objects of my experience, mm -hmm. we try to talk about that and negate that. What Vedanta asks us to do is to question all these kinds of conclusions. Mm -hmm. All the various notions, concepts that I have about myself, it is asking us to evaluate all that very critically. You do not need to know about a new Atma. Already known I is sufficient. Hmm? What Vedanta, Vedanta Vichara wants you is to question the notions about yourself. The entire Vedanta Shastra uh, is not a study about Atma. It is a study about those attributes and the falsity of those attributes. Whatever concepts, whatever notions you have about yourself, they do not belong to you. 
So Atma Jnanam is knowledge about the falsity of the attributes that I have in ignorance added on to me. Any description about me is always in the form of I am dot 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 something. So the study, the vichara is not about the I am part, but only about the dot 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 and to negate that part. It is the study about the attributes. Having studied the attributes, I come to three conclusions. First is that all attributes that I attach to myself do not belong to me. Ichadvesha sukham dukkam sangatas chetana dhritihi yeta kshetram samasena savikara mudhadrutham. See, in the 13th verse, 13th chapter, Bhagavan talks about the first knowledge is that all emotional problems do not belong to me. This is number one. Next is that all the attributes that I attach to myself, they are mitya illusion. They do not belong to me. Number two, that they are not real. The third conclusion is that they are all false. They can never affect me. The attributes do not belong to me. They are false and they do not taint me. So, Atma Jnanam is not about Atma per se, but it is about those attributes that I have added on to me. And why do you call it Atma Jnanam? You should call it Attribute Jnanam. True, to some extent, that, that's there's some truth to it. We call it Atma Jnanam because the attributes were attached to this Atma before. But now they are taken away from, from me, from the Atma, from the self. Therefore, it gives me an unadulterated knowledge about myself. So you can say figuratively it is called Atma Jnanam. But the study is all about all the other attributes, notions, concepts, and negating them. So, Atma Jnanam is the negation of all attributes. There is no other Atma Jnana. Just say, I am. Period. Don't add anything more to that. I am. That is Vedanta. That is Saddarshana. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shante 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 Harihi Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Harihi Om